I heard <laughs> yes and no. I don't know who's not ready for weekend, but I know I am. All right, so um, I'm going to finish up with a couple of things about protein structure, and then we're going to go to the application of knowledge about protein structure and talk about uh, purification. Um, so that's coming up. OK. Um, last time I um, got tied, talked about ribonuclease. I talked about um, how um, that folding is critical and how we can um, take apart the folding in a protein like ribonuclease. And I talked about the sort of special way that ribonuclease uh, operates because it, it really can sort of refold itself. But the fact that it can refold itself without any other information tells us that the sequence of amino acids is, is, is what drives that folding process. We don't fully understand the folding process. Okay? We don't fully understand the folding process. And I want to bring up something that um, I, I don't have a, a figure for because it's more of a mental exercise than anything else. But it kind of illustrates the issue of folding. So we look at folding and we say, well, OK, we look at a, a structure of a protein, and we can say from that structure of a protein that, well, this sort of makes sense. We look at how the folds occur. We know that folds occur, for example, with respect to uh, prolines very commonly. We see this some, to some extent with tryptophans and so forth as well. And so these folds sort of make sense from a um, constraint perspective in terms of shape and size and, and things like that. And we also know the forces like the hydrogen bonds, the disulfide bonds, the ionic bonds, and so forth that help to hold uh, those things together. And so that's uh, useful information. And we know the geometry, certainly, of every amino acid that's in a protein. So you might think that it would be very easy for us to take a given sequence and predict what the structure of a protein would be. And we can't. We can't do it. All right? We can predict secondary structure very nicely. We can look and say, OK, here's a stretch of amino acids that are very consistent with secondary structure. And we can say this portion of a protein has alpha helical structure, for example. And we can say that with a pretty high degree of accuracy. We don't have too much trouble predicting where certain secondary structures will be. But if you think about that three-dimensional nature of a protein, you realize that those bends played a big role. And if we have a protein that's got several bends, even the slightest change in the angle of one bend really has a big effect on what the angle the next one will be, the next one will be, and, and so on and so forth. And so you might think, well, you know, we can get a pretty good idea. And people are getting better about predicting the structures of protein. And by the way, we know the structures of proteins because people measure them. They determine them. We'll talk a little bit about techniques for doing that later. Okay? But to give you an idea about the immensity of the problem, back in the 60s, people thought, well, now that computers are coming along, and now that we know something about the structure of the amino acids in proteins, and we know secondary structures and so forth, it shouldn't be too long before we can predict the three-dimensional structures of proteins with high accuracy. Okay? Well, today it's 50 years later since the first uh, real computers were out there, and we still can't do it. There was a, uh, a person named Leventhal who sat down and applied some mental logic to this problem. Now, I told you last time that there is a certain randomness in the way that these structures can form. But it's clear that what's bringing them together is not pure randomness, although randomness probably does play some role in that overall process. Leventhal said, what if the whole process were driven solely by randomness? And I, a computer is really good at randomness, because a computer can say this possibility, this possibility, this possibility, millions of possibilities per second, randomly putting them together. Leventhal said, how many possibilities would it have to consider on a random basis to be able to determine the structure of a fairly simple polypeptide chain? He said, what if we had one that was 50 amino acids long? That's not very long for a protein. And we considered all the possible angles that would be reasonable for these um, uh, amino acids to have between each other and the interactions that would occur between them. And we start 
randomly doing this, how long would it take us to calculate the correct structure of this 50 amino acid protein? Okay. When he did this calculation, he was absolutely astonished. Okay. Not only did he discover that if he took all the random possibilities and put them together, that the computers of his era would not do it. He discovered that the computers of the era that we're in right now would not do it. He also discovered that the computers of any imaginable system that we would put together in the next 20 years wouldn't do it. In fact, what he found was if we took all of the fastest computers on the face of the earth that exist today, okay, the fastest computers on the face of the earth today, and we combined all of their computing power across the world, and we put them on the problem of randomly determining interactions that would give rise to the correct structure for this 50 amino acid protein. His calculations showed that it would take a million times longer than the age of the universe to determine that structure. Yeah, OK? There are a lot of possibilities. And if we approach the problem as purely a random one, we're not going to solve the structure of the protein. Okay. Well, there are components of the folding of a protein that we don't fully understand. But people are making some very good headway in being able to do that. And there are claims now that there are at least a couple of proteins that people have made very, very good predictions about what that structure of a protein actually is. So perhaps someday that actually will happen. But it's clearly not going to be determined by a random process. Leventhal's paradox is what it's called. OK. Um, let's see. So. Um, I mentioned that some amino acids do, in fact, uh, have certain tendencies to be in certain types of structures. And this figure shows the tendency of certain amino acids to exist in uh, these structures. The higher the number in each case, the greater the tendency to be in that structure. So if we look at alpha helices, for example, glutamic acid really, really likes to be in an alpha helix. One of the ways people use information in tables like this is they look at the sequence of a given protein and they say, if I see a stretch of amino acids that contains this group right, these groups right here that have high tendency, the likelihood that this part of a protein will be in alpha helix is high. And those predictions, as I said, are very good. People can make pretty good predictions about what regions of a protein are in alpha helix, what regions of a protein are in beta strands? You see the beta strands here. Valine really likes to be in beta strands and beta sheets. And what parts are in reverse turns? These are these turns that we talked about. There's glycine uh, and, and various other things down here. Here's our friend proline. Okay. So we see that these turns and these strand, beta strands and alpha helices, we can predict with reasonable accuracy where they occur inside a protein. But even with that information, we still can't get real good 3D information about a protein. Question. Yeah, question. What is the scale of, I guess, what is the most um, I don't know what the absolute is on the scale. These are relative measures. And they're relative measures uh, according to the, all the structures that people have, no, you know, that where they, they've determined the structure of a protein. And they've said, this is a relative tendency. How often, relatively speaking, do I find glutamic acid in an alpha helix? And that's, that's really all that is. But it's just a relative number. It's not an absolute. Yeah? Sure. Are there, are there experimental ways to determine protein structure? In fact, the experimental ways to determine protein structure is how we actually know protein structure. So the experimental methods for determining protein structure most commonly include things called x-ray crystallography that I'll talk briefly about uh, probably on Monday, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, where um, we learn something about the uh, most commonly the proton um, electronic environment of a protein, and things like circular dichroism, which um, help with a lot with secondary structure and so forth. So, but yes, there are, there are definitely experimental ways of making these determinations. One of the things about de making determinations is it's tedious and time consuming. A person could work on the structure of a protein after they've gotten it pure. And it takes a lot of purity to get a protein to be able to study. So the, the purity, the making of a, what's called a crystal, um, these sorts of things are very time consuming. And then 
after you take the spectra, that is, shooting the various uh, electro pieces of electromagnetic radiation through them, the interpretation can take months and months. So having the ability to be able to predict structure from sequence is a very desirable thing. Um, it would also be very desirable for people to say, OK, well, I want to change this one amino acid here. What is the effect it's going to have on this structure? That would also be really, really powerful and useful. We don't have that ability at this time. OK. There we go. Um, let's see. And the uh, last thing I want to talk about relative to protein structure um, are prions. Prions are, are bizarre things. Okay? They're really bizarre. Prions okay, are basically misfolded proteins. Why do we care about misfolded proteins? Well, if you've ever heard of mad cow disease, you've heard of prions. Because prions are the cause of mad cow disease. There are many animal diseases related to mad cow disease, and they all are caused by prions. There's a human form of the disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob, and no, you don't need to know that name. But Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome also arises from misfolding of the very same protein that misfolds in cows. very same protein. Okay? The protein is slightly different in humans, but the misfolding of that protein. And what these diseases do is they give rise to severe neurological problems resulting in dementia and usually fairly rapid death. There's a disease in sheep called scrapie, and there's a variety of them. Okay? Now, it's not completely understood how these diseases are transmitted. It's not completely understood. But there are um, some suggestions that the food supply could be a source of this. It's very hotly contested by some people. But there was um, uh, a uh, set of incidents back in the 1990s in Great Britain where there was um, a, uh, an outbreak of mad cow disease. The out outbreak of mad cow disease um, was not carefully monitored. The meat supply was not carefully monitored. And, many, and some of that meat made it into the human food supply. And within a few years, the incidence of a, an unusual form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome in humans appeared in Great Britain. Was that, was that a cause effect? Not completely understood. But there's concern that that happened. When we think about this misfolded protein, okay, the way that it works is we don't really understand how and why it starts out with a misfold. But the fact that it does misfold causes us some very severe concerns. Because the misfolding of one protein, of this particular protein that's found in the brain, the misfolding of this one protein, this misfolded protein facilitates the misfolding of the same protein. So we could imagine that this is like an infection, if you think about it, because in an infection, one viral particle makes many copies of itself, and they go out and cause problems. This one particle of the protein that's misfolding is now causing normal copies of the same protein to misfold. I want to emphasize something here. This is misfolding. This is not mutation. This is not caused by a mutation. It's caused by a protein that didn't fold properly or got misfolded along the way somehow, unfolded and refolded in the wrong way. You might think, OK, well, I eat meat. I'm fine. I don't eat brains. OK, so I'm OK. And even if I do eat brains, I don't eat raw brains. I eat cooked stuff, so I'm fine. You're not, OK? At least, is at least if you're thinking that cooking is going to take care of you. Because it turns out that this misfolded protein is extraordinarily stable. The temperature it takes to unfold, that is to ruin the shape, denature the shape of the misfolded protein, the temperature it takes to do that is about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Nobody I know or no recipes I know of say that you should cook your food at 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, So that's a concern. I can't tell you that it's caused by that. I can't tell you it's transmitted in that way. But I can tell you those are concerns that some people have. Questions about that? Yeah? 
Um, we will just call it a prion, just P-R-I-O-N. That, that's a name for this group uh, of proteins across all species. So prions are, are misfolded proteins. Well, the good news, yeah. Would it be unfavorable? Well, it's certainly unfavorable for the organism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, when we think about favor and disfavor, from an evolutionary standpoint, okay, it might actually be favorable for this to happen. How might that happen? Well, it's happening after reproductive years. Right? So that's just one perspective. Yes, question over here. Are all prions extremely stable? The answer is basically yes, they are. Question back here. Do all, pro do all prions cause other proteins of the same type to misfold? That's the way they work. Yes. Yep. Back there. Yeah. It's a good question. Because we don't know the link and we don't know the cause, I can't tell you the definitive answer to that question. Okay. The concern is that the misfolded proteins that people get in the diet might be favoring the misfolded proteins that's in the human brain. The people who developed the uh, Kreutzfeldt Cove developed a variant of it, and that's not completely understood. Uh, I got a bunch of hands now. Deidre. Uh-huh. Yep. And there are other proteins that can misfold and cause problems. There are some thoughts that uh, Alzheimer's, for example, may be a prion-like mechanism uh, that is giving rise to that. So there's a lot of uh, different uh, possibilities associated with that. You bet. Back, oh, I'm sorry. Send me the link, or I'll, I'll be happy to spread that to the class. Uh, let's see, back over there. Again, I can't, I, as I said, I can't claim this. I, I, I don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer to that. The concern was that this mad cow ep, um, epidemic a few years later gave rise to a problem in humans. Is there a link? I can't tell you. Some people think there is. So that's, that's as much as I can tell you. How does the misfolding of proteins in one cell spread to other cells? One of the ways in which this can happen is the misfolding of proteins can actually rupture the cell. These things, uh, in many cases, happen in neurological tissue and actually damage and destroy the neurological tissue, which is why the dementia and so forth arises. Yeah. Is there another alternative pr uh, hypothesis for why this is happening? There's no alternative hypothesis for the mechanism of prions, that is the misfolding. That's, that's very well established. The only things people argue about is how it's transmitted. Okay. And then what? About what? As I said, we don't have any good theory about how they're transmitted. We don't know, right? Yes? I'm going to talk about a, um, one of the ways in which proteins properly fold in a second. Maybe that'll give you some thoughts. How about that? I see one more hand, and I'll take one more question. Over. Yeah. Stephanie? Um, so, do you know how prions can invade cells and then make them pass through their cellular How do prions evade cellular mechanisms for dealing with them? Well, one of the, the uh, organismal ways of dealing with things is an immune system. And since it's a native protein to the body, the immune system doesn't recognize it as foreign, doesn't cause a problem. I can't uh, comment on cellular mechanisms because, again, uh, I, there's not enough that's really known about how the prion is, is spreading. Okay, good questions. Prions usually cause a lot of thought about that. I'll give you one more that usually also usually causes a lot of thought and questions about the same thing, and that is 
There are things that we have in our cells okay, that ensure that proteins, as much as possible, do properly fold. Okay? There's a class of proteins called chaperonins, or chaperones. You can call them either one, as far as I'm concern, concerned. Okay? Chaperonins provide some proteins with a mechanism for folding properly. Now let's think about that for a second. Some proteins need help in folding properly. Okay? These chaperones are made, first of all, at a basal level to deal with these, this class of proteins that doesn't fold properly. And when you experience things like fever or heat shock, okay, the cells of virtually every species on the face of the earth induces expression of chaperonins at that point, and it's thought that what they are doing is helping misfolded things to fold properly because the, the heat may have denatured them partly. Okay. Well, how do they work, and why are they there? And that, the, two answers, the answers to those two questions are pretty much the same answer. Okay. Let's imagine that I am a ribosome making a protein. My ribosomes, of course, translate messenger RNA into protein. You saw an example for, uh, of porin. Porin was an odd protein. Its hydrophobics were on the outside. Its hydrophilics were on the inside, right? For any protein that's made, it's going to have some hydrophobic amino acid residues. And we know that for most proteins, they fold and they end up on the inside of a protein, especially if the protein is soluble in water, right? OK? Let's imagine that as that protein is being made, Here's a string of hydrophobic, 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 hydrophobic amino acid that in the final protein is going to make it on the inside, but meanwhile, the rest of the protein isn't there. So now you get this stretch of five or six or eight or ten hydrophobic amino acids, and they don't like water. What are they going to do? Okay. Well, they're going to try to clump with each other. They probably won't be able to clump with each other very well because they can't sort of shield each other from water. One of the things that they can do is they can interact with another of the same protein being made, and their hydrophobics can interact between chains. Right? So the hydrophobics of this one interacting with the hydrophobics of this one. And if that happens, what you get is clumping, clustering, right? Well, usually you don't want those proteins doing that. Clumping and clustering will be a problem. So when pro certain proteins are being made, instead of being made out here in the wide open environment of the aqueous environment of the cell, they are made, they're dumped into chaperonins as they're being made. So they don't get to see each other. They don't get a chance to interact and clump. And what happens is the environment of the chaperone makes a little chamber, it's like a little tube. And this protein gets in there and it can't interact with anything else and it allows itself to fold properly by preventing those external interactions. So the chaperonin provides an environment that's conducive to the protein folding properly. That's pretty cool. Questions about that? Yeah? What helps the chaperonins to fold? OK, not all proteins need assistance folding. Chaperonins don't need assistance to fold. Only some proteins need that assistance of chaperonins. So chaperonins don't have any problem at all with their own folding. Yeah? That what? That you what? No, it has really little to do with whether or not fever is there. Fever actually has some advantages uh, to the body. And so we don't want to look at this as a black and white that there's good or bad associated with, with uh, fever. But this mechanism of inducing the expression of uh, heat shock proteins may be a preventative mechanism to keep from additional problems that would happen from, let's say, denaturing of a protein. Um, does this play a role in exercising? It could. I don't know. Don't know. Yeah. yeah. So when you're talking about heat shock proteins, for example, like an animal that produces highly upregulating chaperones. Yes. Heat shock proteins. Right. Uh, so, 
So the question is, when the heat shock occurs, are the proteins that are being um, made the protein that's, uh, un, that, that's denatured or the chaperonins? It's actually the chaperonins. Yeah. yeah. Are the particular to, uh, are the chaperone proteins particular to the protein they help fold? There are different groups of, of chaperones that may uh, play a role in helping folding to happen. So there may be some of that, but I don't know of any specific things to that. Okay. All right. Well, good questions. Obviously, as I say, these usually spark a uh, variety of uh, thoughts and questions. Let's uh, turn our attention. Oh, and I haven't done the limerick for the day, so I should do the limerick for the day at this point. The limerick. Yeah, limerick. Okay. The boy Candle wondered if whether he should ask out the girl Candle Heather to ride in his car out under the stars so they can both go out together. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. All right. We turn our attention now to the application of knowledge about proteins to their purification. And we talk about purification here. We're not talking about spiritual purification. We are talking about their isolation. Okay. All right, their isolation. Isolating proteins is really at the root of biochemistry. The reason, one of the reasons that you go into a biochemistry lab and you always see a centrifuge is because purification frequently and usually involves, at some point, centrifugation. Okay? Biochemists are obsessed with purification because if we think about it, our cells make any, of any given cell that we have makes, on average, about 5,000 proteins. And when I want to understand what any given protein does, it's much easier for me to understand and study the protein if it's all by itself than if it's with 4,999 other proteins. It's almost impossible for me to study it in the mix of that other proteins. So being able to study it all by itself is important, which means I need to be able to isolate it. Okay. Well, we go to isolate proteins, we have to think a little bit about how we go about uh, doing that. I mentioned centrifugation as uh, an important step. And centrifugation applies uh, centrifugal force as a sort of artificial gravity. And that centrifugal force provides a way to separate things on the basis, uh, 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 crudely on the basis of size. And I say crudely because centrifugation is very good for fairly large things. If I take and I want to isolate a protein, for example, and I know the protein is dissolved in the cytoplasm of a cell, then if I take and I bust open the cell, releasing the cytoplasmic contents, what I've got is I've got a cell membrane that's floating out here that's fairly large. I can put it into a centrifuge, spin it down to the bottom, and I can get a pellet that has all the junk that I don't want and collect the liquid, which has the um, uh, cytoplasmic materials, and my protein will be in that liquid. So centrifugation provides a crude way of separating big and small. As you might imagine, the more we centrifuge something, okay, the more we can do that separation. So we see up here from uh, the top that we have a relatively uh, low centrifugal force, 10,000 times gravity, 100,000 times gravity, uh, etc. So we can do separations uh, and there was 500 times gravity up there, okay? So separations and use different centrifugal force means of isolating them. So that, that, that's a very general uh, method for us. Once we've done that very general method, we then have to isolate um, the uh, protein from whatever it is that we've gotten. So in this case, let's say I had cytoplasm that's there. That cytoplasm still might contain a couple of thousand or 4,000 proteins within it. So I still have to do that isolation of what's in that cytoplasm. And by the way, you might say, well, why aren't they all in the cytoplasm? And the answer is because there are many proteins that are found in membranes. Okay, so many proteins found in membranes. Well, one of the things that we can do during uh, the isolation procedure is something called dialysis. Dialysis is a very simple technique. It doesn't really provide us purification of the protein but it does allow us to separate the protein from very tiny molecules. Salts. Salts turn out to be, uh, during certain isolation procedures, salts are used to precipitate proteins. 
So let's say my protein uh, that I was interested in studying, I found that it was a given salt concentration that caused my protein to form a precipitate. I might say, okay, let's use that concentration. We'll form a precipitate. We put it in a centrifuge. And when we take the liquid away, we've gotten rid of a lot of things that didn't precipitate. When I resuspend my protein so that it now goes back into liquid, then I want to get rid of the salt. This method would allow me to get rid of the salt. I think everybody's probably played in biology class with dialysis tubing, where you take and put a protein or some mixture in the dialysis tubing, you put it into water, and you see the dialysis tubing start to swell because the protein can't diffuse out. The water diffuses in to try to, to uh, adjust that concentration. That's exactly what's going on here. The salts are small. They can go through the dialysis tubing, and they pop back out. So this is, again, a way of separating a protein from small molecules. A little bit more powerful technique is something called gel filtration. Okay. Gel filtration is, is also called um, molecular exclusion. Both of those are used to describe the same process, gel filtration and molecular exclusion. And this technique uses something very cool. You see an enlargement of it, of it over on the right side. So what you see the enlargement of is one of these tubes. These tubes are what we call a column. And the column has within it it's been what we say packed. That is, someone has taken a bunch of little tiny beads with some liquid, and they've poured it into this tube. Now, the beads have a very cool property associated with them that I'm going to tell you about. And the beads have little tiny holes within them. And they're made so that the little tiny holes that they have have a very given, much fixed given size. We can control within that bead the size of the hole. And the holes make little tunnels through the bead. Little tunnels, OK? It's a pretty cool process by which they're made. And they have a very fixed dimension, OK? If we think about proteins, proteins vary in size from being very small to being very large. And most of them are globular, which means that we can think of them as sort of folded up like this. They might have different shapes, but they're mostly sort of rounded kind of structures, right? Well, if I have proteins of different sizes, I'll have some that have little tiny shapes, some that have bigger shapes, OK? And if those shapes roughly correspond to the size of these tunnels, I can use the tunnels as a means of separation. How does it work? Well, the way it works is here's a mixture of proteins. Here's some that are smaller, shown in red. And here's some larger ones that are shown in yellow. The ones in yellow are large enough that they don't fit in the tunnels. They don't fit in the tunnels. Therefore, they don't enter any of the beads. They simply stay in the solution that they're in, and they just go boing, 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 boing and they're out. They're not going through the beads, but they're just going around them. The smaller guys up here, the smallest guys up here, fit into those little tunnels very readily. And what happens with them is they're like, I like to describe a kid at the fair. They want to go on every ride. They go through this tunnel over here. Oh, here's another one over here. Oh, here's another one over here. Here's another one over here. And the path that's something that fits in the tunnels takes is much longer, it's much greater, and it takes longer for the little guys to come out. So in molecular exclusion chromatography, or gel filtration, again, the two terms are used uh, equally, in this type of chromatography, and by the way, chromatography simply means separation. Okay? Chromatography means separation. In this type of chromatography, the largest proteins will come through first, and the smallest proteins will come through last. Yeah, question. Well, back. Does it use a pressure difference? No, it does not. It's just basically done with gravity, and it just flows through in, in that way. Garrett? What are the beads made of? They're made of something called cephidex. 
And that, that's a trade name, uh, and it, it's uh, given for the, actually the way that this, um, these, these compounds are made. Yeah? Uh huh. It's not how it, it's not how fast it falls. It's how the, the length of the path that it takes. So I, I'd like to get, go back to the fair example. Okay. Here are the grandparents. Here are the parents, and here are the children. And you go walking across a fairground with those. Grandma and Grandpa don't want to lose their lunch because they lose their lunch a lot. They don't want to go on the rides. Okay? They'll walk around the rides, but they're not going to stop and go on each one. Mom and Dad are worried about the kids, so they're going to ride some of the more dangerous rides with the kids to hang on to them, right? It's going to take Mom and Dad here in the middle longer than it takes the grandparents to go through because the Mom and Dad's going to ride some of the rides. The kids want to ride every ride. Their path is the longest. Does that help? That's another hand. OK. All right. Let's talk about another type of cool chromatography. This is called ion exchange chromatography. It relies on the charge of a protein for its separation. We saw that proteins can have charge. Hopefully, you've worked through some of the practice problems I gave you. And you can see that charge. And you can even calculate that charge pretty readily. If you haven't done that, you should do that. Well, what this method does is it relies not on beads with tunnels in them, but beads with charges on them. Beads with charges on them. This particular example shows beads with negative charges on them. What's going to stick to them when I pour through a mixture of proteins? Well, the proteins that are the most positively charged are going to stick the most. The ones that are the most negatively charged are going to stick the least, and they're going to come out first. Okay. This particular type of chromatography that I'm, just, that I'm showing you here is called cation exchange chromatography. In cation exchange chromatography, the positives stick to the beads. In anion exchange chromatography, this is reversed. The beads are positively charged, and the uh, protein that sticks is the negatively charged protein. So cation exchange chromatography, the positively charged proteins stick the most. In anion exchange chromatography, the negatively charged proteins stick the most. Okay, Don't confuse those two. Okay. Um, and here's what some of the things, actually, the, the actual charges. If we think about it, here's that bead. Here's the chemicals that's on. There's a carboxyl group, negatively charged. Here's an amine group, positively charged. You don't need to know those structures. I'm just showing them for your own curiosity. OK. A very cool type of chromatography is known as affinity chromatography. Very useful. It's illustrated here. Okay. Affinity chromatography relies on the tendency of certain proteins to bind to certain molecules or structures. All right. To illustrate this a little better, let's imagine that I have a protein that I know binds to ATP. Very common in cells. ATP is the energy source in cells. And so many proteins will bind to ATP because they can use it for energy. Okay, And I say, OK, I'm interested in this protein. It binds to ATP. How might I use that knowledge to isolate this protein? Well, the way I do that is by taking the beads, and instead of digging tunnels through them, or instead of sticking positive and minus charges on them, I stick ATP onto them. So now I've got a bead that's got hundreds or thousands of ATPs sticking off of it. You can think of it as those Gs right there. Okay. And I take a mixture of proteins and I pour it on the top of the column. Which ones are going to stick? Well, the ones that are going to stick are all going to be ones that bind to ATP. Usually, that's going to be more than one protein. OK? 
okay, in the case of ATP, because there are many proteins that bind to ATP. But there's a lot of proteins that won't bind to ATP, and they'll come shooting off the column. How do I get my protein off the column if it binds to ATP and I've got ATP there? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, if you add ATP to this, what will happen is the protein that sees the ATP on here, these bindings that proteins do to molecules are not covalent, meaning they come off, they go on. They come off, they go on. When it comes off and there's ATP sitting out here, it grabs the ATP that's free and it comes off. Okay? So I actually isolate it by adding the molecule that the protein will bind to to it, and now the protein comes shooting off the column. That turns out to be useful for other things uh, later that we'll see as well. Yes? Is it difficult to get uh, free of any ATP? Well, it's a little bit more involved, but it's not impossible to do. It's definitely possible to do. So that's, that's not a, a big problem. OK. Now, I want to jump down and talk about, I'm going to come back and talk about HPLC next time. But this time, I want to talk about gel electrophoresis. How many people in here have done gel electrophoresis? Oh, virtually everybody's done gel electrophoresis. OK, so it means I don't have to cover this then, right? No. OK. So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is one type of gel electrophoresis. And it's the less common of the two. If you've worked in a DNA lab, you've probably done agarose gel electrophoresis. How many people know the difference between those two? OK, OK. So I'm going to show you an example of agarose to start with. Because agarose gel electrophoresis, that's actually uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. That is too. Um, well, this could be, OK, this could be agarose as well. All right. So agarose, the difference between the two is really the material that makes the gel. Okay? A gel is, as its name suggests, gelatinous. And it is what we call a support. It's a solid. And it is covered with a buffer solution. You can see the buffer solution up here on the top. And you can see the same buffer solution down here on the bottom. And this buffer, and, and this gel itself, I like to think of as having tunnels of its own. These tunnels of its own are much bigger than the tunnels we saw in those little beads. Okay? In the case of agarose gel electrophoresis, the tunnels are quite large. And the reason they're quite large is because DNA is enormous. DNA is much bigger than protein. So we have to provide a way for these tunnels to do the separation that we saw in gel exclusion chromatography. And so the passage through these tunnels is going to provide a mechanism. But if we let gravity go, as we let, gra as we let go on the gel exclusion chromatography, it, nothing's going to happen. We actually have to force the DNA molecules into this gel. The force that we use is an electrical field. And this works really well with DNA because DNA is negatively charged. It has, it's full of phosphates. I set it up so that the top, where I, I actually pour my DNA samples into these little things called wells, the top is where I apply the negative electrode, and the bottom is where I apply the positive. Well, DNA is negatively charged. It wants to get away from the electrode. It enters the gel. And it starts moving through it, driven by the electrical field. OK? It's driven by the electrical field. Now we've got a force that's pushing that DNA molecule through. And the only difference, then, with which the DNA molecules go through is how big they are. The bigger they are, they have more phosphates, so they have more force. The smaller they are, the fewer the phosphates they have, the less force. And the only difference is their size, because they each have the same amount of force per size. That means that the smallest DNA molecules will go fastest, because they navigate their way through the pores much better. And by the way, these aren't tunnels where they're going to see which one goes 
uh, the longer path, this is which, how fast they can make it directly down through the pores. So in gel electrophoresis, the smallest guys go first. The largest guys have the most difficult time, and they go last. So we can see here, and this is shown for proteins, but we can see here, there's the slowest moving ones, there's the mom and dad, and the kids are way down here. Everybody with me? Everybody getting tired? Are we ready for a song? OK. Some of this song I'm going to sing may, uh, by the way, this, this song today is the first time I've ever sung this song to a class. So it's a relatively new song. And it may cover some things that I'll finish talking about on Monday. It's to the tune of an old Beatles song called I've Just Seen a Face. Anybody know the song? Am I the only? I've Just Seen a Face? OK. It's called, all right, where am I at here? Please sing with me. I've Just Run a Jail. I've just run a gel. I do not think it went too well. I may have used a bit much SDS. The stacker's looking like a mess, it's true. Oh, now what will I do? The protein sample's my last one to purify. It was not fun. I spent three weekends working late. The middle lanes aren't looking great. I'm screwed. Good God, what will I do? Crawling, I'm almost bawling. The boss is calling to follow through. I can't, my, off the tune. I just load it all. I've got to make this final Western blot. My fingers are both crossed for sure. I hope my protein product's pure. I do. Then my thesis is through. Hating all of the waiting. I'm contemplating what I should do. Staining, my eyes are straining, there's no complaining, I say wahoo. Cause it has the band I need, I'll go and have it scanned to speed the writing of my thesis and proceed on to the postdoctoral plan. Oh, that will be so grand. Pieces make up my thesis, no more for Reese's, the promised land. Writing, so unexciting, but no more biting, my nails again. Writing is coinciding with reference citing. I'm at the end. That was terrible. Okay. <laughs>